Thank you. Sin Zhao. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful to be here in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Please have a seat. Uh, I just had uh, the opportunity to visit the Jade Emperor Pagoda. And I think going from a 100-year-old sacred temple to this 21st century dreamplex is, I think, a wonderful expression of the evolution that's taken place here in Vietnam, uh, a country that honors its history, uh, but is also boldly racing towards the future. And that's also the story of this city. Uh, this is a city on the move, and, and we could see as we were traveling in from the airport all the activity that's currently taking place. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the traffic, uh, although uh, I do think it might be easier to be on a, a motorbike than a motorcade. Uh, but this city, like it's, this country, is, is full of energy. You can see it in the skyscrapers shooting above the horizon and the shops that are springing up in every corner. Uh, you can see it online, where tens of millions of Vietnamese are connecting with each other and with the world. And you can feel it here at Dreamplex, where ideas are becoming a reality. Uh, I just had a chance to see some of these ideas in action. Uh, young people who are uh, making things happen. Uh, I saw a virtual game that can help people recover from nerve injuries uh, to a machine that lets you smartphone control a laser cutter, uh, although you have to be careful with the laser cutter where you point it. Uh, uh, but some of this energy may be due to your famous uh, cafe tron. Uh, uh, that stuff is strong, I understand. Uh, but the real driver of Viet, uh, Vietnam's growth and the engine of Ho Chi Minh City is the spirit of entrepreneurship, the spirit that brings us here today. Uh, and I see it everywhere I travel all around the world. I meet people, and especially young people, like the three that we're about to meet. Uh, who are eager to strike out on their own, start something new, and shape their own destinies. Many want to do more than just create uh, a great new app for a phone. Uh, they want to contribute uh, to their communities and help people live better lives. And that's what entrepreneurship is all about. It's building businesses, making a profit, hopefully, uh, but it's also about creating good jobs and developing new products and devising ways to serve others. Entrepreneurship is also the fuel for prosperity that puts rising economies on the path to success. It's what gives young people, uh, like so many of you, the chance to channel your energy and your passion into something that is bigger than yourselves. And it allows us to come across countries and cultures to solve some of the world's greatest challenges. Uh, of course, being an entrepreneur is not easy. It's not easy in the United States. It's not easy here in Vietnam. Uh, it's not easy any place in the world. Uh, it can be tough to get started. It's hard to access capital. Uh, it's hard to get the skills that you need to run a business. You might not always have the mentors and the networks that can help guide you along the way. And it can be especially difficult for women, uh, for others who traditionally are not viewed as uh, being at the center of business life in a country, haven't had all the access to the same opportunities. So we've got to tap all the talent that's out there. Uh, just because you are born poor does not mean you should not be able to start a business. Uh, just because you don't look like uh, the traditional businessman doesn't mean you sh can't make a great product or deliver a great service. Uh, and that's why DreamPlex is so important. Uh, it's not only a uh, home for digital uh, entrepreneurs like you. It's also a place where you can share ideas and work together and build a community that supports each other. And incubators like this uh, allow Vietnam, alongside its uh, emphasis on entrepreneurship, uh, to see more startups happening uh, in this country than ever before. Recently, uh, in one year alone, the funding for startups doubled in this country. And we're seeing major acquisitions, like Fossil Group's takeover of Misfit Wearables, a Vietnamese company that makes uh, devices like fitness trackers. Uh, we're seeing Vietnamese Americans who are coming here to start new ventures. 
uh, and that shows the strong bond between the United States and Vietnam. And the world is taking notice. Uh, a leading global venture capital firm called 500 Startups just launched a $10 million fund here in Ho Chi Minh City. Next month at our Global Entrepreneurship Summit, something that I've been hosting now uh, for several years, uh, I'll welcome eight Vietnamese entrepreneurs to Sil Silicon Valley so that they can uh, learn from some of the best entrepreneurs and startups and venture capitalists in the world. A and your success sends a message to global investors about this country's incredible potential for innovation. Hopefully it also encourages other Vietnamese entrepreneurs to chase that new great idea and start that new company uh, which will continue to fuel uh, an ever-expanding Vietnamese economy. Uh, I'm here today because the United States is committed to being a partner as you grow. Uh, with the Peace Corps coming to Vietnam for the first time, our volunteers are going to help more Vietnamese learn English, uh, the language that so often is used in the global economy. With programs like our Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative, we're helping give thousands of young people across Vietnam the skills and networks they need to turn their ideas into action. With our U.S. ASEAN Connect initiative, we're matching American investors with Vietnamese entrepreneurs in areas like clean energy. With the Women's Entrepreneurship Center, we're going to open here in Vietnam. Uh, we create is what we're going to call it. Uh, we'll help empower the next generation of women business owners. And if we really want to encourage entrepreneurship and innovation, I should mention that we need to move ahead with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because TPP will not only let us sell more of our goods to each other and bring our economies closer together, it will accelerate economic reforms here in Vietnam, boost your economic competitiveness, open up new markets, not only for large companies, but also for small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, it'll raise labor and environmental standards, and it will improve business conditions so that entrepreneurs like you can thrive. So my message to all the entrepreneurs here today is that I believe in you, America believes in you, and we're going to keep investing in your success. Uh, ultimately, it's the inventors and dreamers, uh, people like uh, those that I just met, those that we'll, about, uh, we'll hear from soon, and all of you in the audience who are going to shape Vietnam's future for decades to come. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from these outstanding young leaders. Thank you very much. Come on. So I'm just going to introduce uh, very quickly these outstanding young business people who are leading the way here in Vietnam. We invited them here uh, to give us uh, some of their thoughts about what would make uh, it easier for them to start their businesses and to uh, continue to uh, nurture uh, the startups that uh, they're involved with. Uh, the first is Kwa Pham, who is the director of legal and corporate uh, at Microsoft Vietnam. We have uh, Lei Huang Oyenvi, uh, who's the founder of uh, Ade Roy, which is aiming to become the Amazon of Vietnam. And we have uh, Duti Thuy Hang, who's the vice president of Seedcom, which invests in Vietnamese companies. So please give them a big round of applause, and we'll start our conversation. So, uh, Vi, let's start with you and, and tell us, it, it sounds like you started being interested in business at a very young age. Um, good evening, Mr. President, and good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to uh, the Vietnamese and the U.S. government for organizing such a wonderful event. Uh, my name is V, and I graduated from Georgetown University in 2009, uh, majoring in finance. Uh, actually, I have had a passion for technology uh, since I was in school. When I was 13, I decided to start my own web design company. And I loved the idea of connecting buyer and seller through an online platform just like eBay or Amazon. But at the moment, I was so young, and I couldn't start a formal business. So therefore, after my college graduation, I decided to come back to Vietnam and started uh, Chan.vn. It's an e-marketplace uh, selling fashion items. And luckily, after five years, uh, we became one of the top destinations for fashion lovers in Vietnam. And we got acquired by the biggest conglomerate in Vietnam called Vingroup. And right now, I'm running uh, Adiro.com. Uh, basically, we are the Amazon of Vietnam. We sell everything from electronics to even grocery online. And our goal is to bring the safe and high-quality products at affordable price to every family in Vietnam. 
That's great. The, uh, now, you, you look very good. Uh, is this some of your fashion that you can sell on, uh, <laughs> online? Is, is that like uh, you can buy the necklace and the earrings? And... They are available on adiro.com. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to, so if, if you're looking for, you know, a good deal. Uh, Excellent. The, uh, and Hang, uh, you started uh, out as an investor, or uh, as an entrepreneur, now you're an investor as well. Tell us uh, what have been the challenges uh, that you've met, and, and uh, uh, have there been some special challenges about being a, a woman uh, entrepreneur and investor here in Vietnam? Thank you, Mr. President. It's my honor to be here as well. And I guess let's take it back a little bit. Uh, I came back to Vietnam five years ago after nine years in the state. Mm -hmm. So America is truly my second home. And when I came back, that was basically because of my very close tie to Vietnam. My family is in here. My hometown is here. I love the people here. Because the environment has been very supporting. I learned a lot from previous generations. And thirdly, because I have seen successful role models here. And that's why I came back. I never thought that being a female entrepreneur would be a disadvantage here in the local market. Because from my experience and observations around the area, I'm very proud to say that in Vietnam, women are treated equally and given a lot of opportunities. So whether we thrive or not, it all starts within ourselves. And we see a lot of women entrepreneurs in the room as well. Chang from Misfit that you just mentioned. She's incredible. Reina, she's not a entrepreneur per se, but she has done a terrific job here in Ho Chi Minh City. We all love her. So um, <laughs> if the war is run by women, and I'm hinting the US election this year, uh, it'll be a better place. Like you always say, you always say that. I do. <laughs> so the, uh, what kind of uh, businesses are you looking to invest in at this point? Um, so Vietnam is among the top exporters of agricultural products in the world. Yet there are a lot of uh, untapped opportunities in agriculture. And it is still a very low tech, low productivity sector. And at Seedcom, we worked with a lot of companies across retail, technology, and logistics. But the project that we are most excited about at the moment is in agriculture, Godet Farm. We apply technology uh, to traditional farming very simple stuff like from uh, tracking to automation. And basically, we bring the products all the way to end users at a higher value. So that signals, I guess, the next wave of innovation in Vietnam, where entrepreneurs and investors come together and using technology to tackle very traditional problems in traditional industries. And we're just super excited about it. Excellent. So the, quad, the you were born here moved to the States uh, when you were 11, is that right? That's right? And got your education there, worked in Washington, uh, ended up at uh, a very, uh, uh, an impressive startup called Microsoft. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so now are here uh, Micros representing Microsoft uh, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. T tell us about uh, what are the opportunities that Microsoft is seeing uh, and uh, how you think uh, U.S. companies can most effectively interact with uh, Vietnamese business people and startups and entrepreneurs? Right. Well, welcome to Vietnam, Mr. President. Uh, I know it's uh, early morning in Washington, D.C. Oh, I've, so, uh, I've gotten over the jet lag. I'm glad you're awake. I'm fine. Uh, so I returned to Vietnam uh, for the same reason that my parents uh, had when they took me out of Vietnam as a young boy. And that is that they wanted me to have an opportunity for a better life. And we found that in the U.S. And after 35 years living in the U.S., I decided to return to Vietnam to give the same opportunity and to make a difference to the young people of Vietnam, many of them are sitting here today. And so the way I look at my return is that Microsoft gives me the opportunity to make a difference, uh, to improve lives for people through the use of technology, as well as to accelerate the development of the country through technology by the improvement of the ICT infrastructure. So I see a lot of uh, impressive 
young entrepreneurs and the spirits of entrepreneurship here in Vietnam. And that's the reason I returned to Vietnam. So, uh, V, you were mentioning how you want to be the Amazon of Vietnam. Uh, tell me about the, the challenges you have in trying to build a digital platform for commerce uh, here in Vietnam and uh, what makes uh, it different trying to develop that here than it might be in the United States where obviously there's more uh, digital platforms and, and penetration. Um, I'm assuming that particularly if you want to reach uh, rural areas that uh, some of the logistical challenges uh, are different. Uh, so, so tell us uh, what uh, has been some of the hardest uh, aspects of, of building on your vision and how do you think both the Vietnamese government or uh, the U.S. government or uh, companies uh, that are interested in, in uh, working with you or other entrepreneurs, how they can be most helpful? Where do you see the biggest uh, roadblocks? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm very passionate about building, um, bringing convenient and modern lifestyle to Vietnamese people. Uh, so imagine that a working mom um, has a job from 6 to 9. Uh, from 9 to 6, and then after 6 p.m., she has to rush to the supermarket to shop uh, for her home dinner. It probably takes her an hour to get home and then ready to cook for the uh, family. Because the traffic is... Right, <laughs> traffic jam. <laughs> so basically imagine that um, one day she can sit in her office and order all the ingredients, and uh, when she gets home, the ingredients will be ready for her to cook dinner for her family. So every day we can save her an hour uh, to spend more time with her family. Imagine that uh, we can save her 360 hours per year, which translates to you know, 7,300 hours over 20 years, which is equivalent to almost a year. So we can save a woman a year over 20 years. So that's, that's our dream. But basically it's, it's very challenging because even online grocery in, in America is difficult because of the infrastructure. It's very, very difficult for us to get the items to the customer on time. Right. And especially, we have a commitment to deliver it within two hours, which is quite impossible when we first started. Right. But then we, we are very committed. So we build our own uh, delivery infrastructure. We build our own delivery man. Uh, and up to now, I think um, we had the feeling of it. So we, we are able to deliver our product as fast as we can to, uh, to you know, satisfy the customers. So a couple of challenges that I think um, you know, either uh, the government in Vietnam or the US government can help us is first is to you know, help us to build up our infrastructure, the logistics, uh, the payments, et cetera, and bring new technology to Vietnam. So that's always been my dream. Right. So, the, uh, so one of the challenges is just making sure that you have the physical infrastructure so that you can deliver fast enough. But uh, in terms of the digital infrastructure, is that well developed because everybody has a smartphone now? It's, it's much, much better now yeah. because um, you know, people, are getting, people are getting used to using their smartphone to, to order things online. Uh, three years ago when I first started, it was so difficult to get people online, but now it's very easy. But, but, but still, you know, um, so the operation infrastructure is not there yet. So we need to learn it from you know, successful companies like Amazon or we need to you know, come, come up with our own solution in Vietnam because the street in Vietnam is not the same in the US. Right, right. You understand, right? So we have all the delivery men in motorbike right. and they have to know their way around. Right. Yeah, it's very difficult to install GPS for the, you know, the delivery man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and ju just one last question. Uh, in terms of access to capital, uh, the, uh, typically our startups here financed, self-financed or they financed through the banks is there, is there enough of a, a sort of a bank infrastructure for small businesses and medium-sized businesses? Uh, or you know, are you using, are, are most entrepreneurs using family savings? Uh, is there venture capital? You know, how, how are people getting started? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, to be honest, I think in Vietnam, uh, it's very difficult to get early funding, especially there's not that many venture capital funds here in Vietnam. 
for seed funding and angel investors, um, very limited. I think most of the investors in Vietnam, they want to invest in companies that have track records, which is a quite, quite a challenge for, for startup in Vietnam. Right. So we have Fire Startup here. It's a good news for us. And we hope that in the near future, more venture funds can come to Vietnam, especially from America, to help us grow um, um, all, the all the new businesses. Well, I'm trying to do some advertising <laughs> for you here. Yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully, hope, hopefully somebody's right. paying attention back in the United States. The, Thank you very much. The, uh, so, uh, Hung, you, you were talking about agriculture. Um, obviously, a large portion of Vietnam uh, is still dependent on basic agricultural uh, and, and, and small farmers. Uh, is the goal here for them to be able to move their products to market at a better price and more quickly, or is it that you want to move up the value chain so that there's uh, more processing that's taking place. Uh, so it's not just rice or uh, other crops, but it's also the products uh, that uh, are derived from uh, uh, the foodstuffs that are being grown. Uh, or is it all of the above? Uh, tell me a little bit more about how you see the opportunity for agriculture to accelerate here in Vietnam. I guess all of the above. Um of course, uh, by ourselves, we cannot change the whole industries, but with many investors and entrepreneurs uh, working together, we believe that we can make a positive impact. So as I mentioned, there are two parts in our business. One is to apply more technology in agriculture. Some technology is just very, very simple, uh, using text message, uh, using simple tracking tools, simple uh, automation on the farm, greenhouse, etc. That improves the productivity massively and that helps directly uh, the farmers uh, to increase their uh, output and as a result, uh, their income. And secondly, basically have a trusted brand and add more value and bring the products to the uh, end users at a higher price. And obviously the result of that is also um, higher income. And we understand that you know, there are a lot of challenges uh, like we mentioned, the logistics is not there yet, quite yet. The infrastructure, there's still a lot to do. But um, we have a, a very young team in Dalat, in where our, where our farm is. And we have a lot of, I know personally, a lot of people, young people, who, are, who start their work in agriculture. And we have so much passion and energy and drive. And beyond that, we even have a strategy and action plan to make this happen. Uh, so hopefully, in the next few years, you'll see some very positive change in agriculture in Vietnam. The, uh so, uh, when you think about business here versus business as you're accustomed to seeing it in the United States, what are some of the big differences? And are there particular areas where you think uh, strategic investment would really make a big difference in helping uh, all these startups take off? Uh, and, and, and in terms of Microsoft strategy, is, is, uh, are your main clients large businesses uh, and just helping them with respect to IT or are you also working with some of these smaller startups uh, to see uh, how you can grow their businesses and, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, help them really take off? Um, I'm sure you have you know, have uh, uh, heard from Satya Nadella, our CEO. Our company mission is to empower every person, and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And I think there's no better market to do that than in Vietnam because of the young entrepreneurs that we have here and the um, pe internet penetration, uh, the uh, mobile uh, uh, base that we have here uh, with young people. And I think that in terms of capturing the opportunity, I think that's important for us to look at uh, for our government and businesses and entrepreneurs to really balance the opportunity and the responsibility in this new world that we live in, which is the mobile first, cloud first world. And so if you look at the challenges in that respect, I think public policy regulatory environment needs to be more conducive, right? Will be, need to be modernized to address the digital economy. And I think that Vietnam is not unique in that space as a developing market. I think in the U.S., you know, um, uh, the, the same is being faced uh, with, you know, how do we uh, deal with e-commerce, uh, cross-border uh, 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 taxation issues, 
and things of that nature. But I think that Vietnam uh, can leapfrog uh, uh, other markets and seeing and capturing that opportunity. And uh, for Microsoft Vietnam in particular, we have a national empowerment plan that basically mirrors the government ICT master plan by 2020 to really develop uh, Vietnam's in, uh, ICT uh, advanced nation. And so in that regard, you know, we look at the three key pillars, which is the ICT infrastructure of the country, uh, helping really secure the cyber uh, security apparatus of the country, um, really looking at the issue of privacy, data protection, uh, the uh, ICT infrastructure for a national cloud, to really take advantage of that. And also our, our investment in the second pillar, which is about small and medium-sized enterprises, I think that is going to be the driving uh, factor for the economic growth of this country. We have you know, about 500,000 SMBs you know, businesses here in that size. And so I would say that the startup community is also the micro uh, businesses that are starting out. And we have programs that provide free software, free cloud services to these startups. So this way, they can really focus on developing the best products. And then, obviously, the education side, we really have to look at capacity building. And that is to really help the Vietnamese move from a labor-intensive economy into more of a knowledge economy, knowledge-based economy. And that is really getting them to, with the right skill set for ICT skill sets. And also, you know, we need to really invest you know, uh, a bit more on STEM education. And we're doing that and teaching uh, with technology in the classrooms and really uh, doing a lot of these um, uh, startup community uh, co-working space, uh, uh, community events to really promote uh, coding because I think that's where it's that's very important. And and uh, I think you were in the KL when we did the Hour of Code and uh, where you uh, uh, worked with the prime minister and, and coding with the, the children. I think that's something that we do here annually as well. Absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, I think that's a great point, and and uh, B uh, and Hung maybe you want to talk about this a little bit. Uh, ultimately. What makes startups and entrepreneurs successful is good ideas uh, and uh, the human capital. Um, you know, obviously, investors are important and infrastructure is important, but the most important thing is people. And uh, when you look at uh, Vietnam right now, it seems as if uh, a culture of entrepreneurship is really beginning to grow. but. Uh, one of the questions that I always have to ask myself in the United States is whether our education system is uh, equipping our children effectively enough to be able to uh, move forward on their ideas. Uh, so uh, uh, you're both very young, so you can still remember what it's like to go to school. For me, it's I've, I've forgotten. But uh, um, I will say that when I was going to school, we didn't have computers. Uh, well, you had these big mainframe computers, but you didn't have personal computers. So, uh, how, how uh, do you see the education system uh, here adapting to uh, the needs of this new 21st century economy? <coughs> Sorry. I still remember uh, taking entrepreneurship classes in the U.S., and I found it so helpful for me to learn about you know, how to write a business plan, how to pitch to investor, how to um, you know, develop a financial model. And I think when I got back here, um, I don't find that many entrepreneurship classes in Vietnam. So I think that there's an empty area that we can tap on. Right. And secondly, I think after the startup get funding, I think they also need mentorship program. Those are the things that really helps um, the, the startup community here in Vietnam. Right. And I also think that um, I, I used to be an exchange student. I uh, came to the US when I was 17. Uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for that because I learned so much about um, you know innovations and uh, I learned how to dream big and you know always hope for a brighter future. So I think um, there's a chance for us to also you know create um, exchange program, not just for students but for working adults. Especially you know we can send um, young startup to um, do on-the-job training or internship program uh, at some you know. Um, U.S. company. So those are the things that I really want to, you know, uh, to get 
to the audience. Good. Huh? I would like to add to what we just said is uh, the power of technology. Again, again, I go back to this point. Uh, with technology, really, um, students or students nowadays have access to a lot more information, a lot more well informed, and education opens a new sector for startups to come and basically kind of disrupt the sector. So our friend here, what Global Shapers, he, he has uh, his own start, um, education startup. Uh, another friend that we uh, know very well, Tu, uh, she launched Elsa, that helps uh, students to learn English through an app. So all of those examples, um, you can see that technology basically just opens the doors and opens opportunities for Vietnamese students to access to global knowledge. And the evidence of that is most of uh, uh, the team that I work with in Vietnam for my previous startup and even uh, at many companies at Seedcom right now, they're all educated in Vietnam. I'm one of the very lucky few that got you know, years of education in the States. But I respect my colleagues a lot every day for they uh, so smart. You know, they learn in Vietnam. They learn not only by going to school, but also by doing, by talking to older people, uh, and obviously learning from the internet. Uh, so I, I do think that technology is changing education. Well, you know, uh, Kwa was talking about leapfrogging. One of the things that you're seeing in countries all around the world is if they hadn't already developed uh, a telephone infrastructure with cellular or with uh, landlines and telephone poles and underground tunnels. Now suddenly they just go straight to cellular towers and, and smartphones. Uh, and banking is done there. And, uh, you know, commerce is done uh, through phones. And, uh, and so they've, they've leapfrogged over the infrastructure requirements uh, of old systems. And the same is true with education. Right? Uh, the, uh, if done properly, the opportunity for online education that is much cheaper but is still of high quality, uh, that can accelerate the ability of, uh, of a child here in Vietnam to uh, learn coding, learn business practices, and so forth uh, without an expensive education or having to study overseas is hugely important. And uh, you know, with our contribution through the Peace Corps, uh, through entrepreneurship summits, through the sponsorships that we're getting various companies to engage in. Uh, our hope is, is that we'll be able to provide uh, the kind of training to young people that will be uh, incredibly powerful uh, for them uh, in the future. And uh, you know, we want to thank uh, the Vietnamese government for uh, uh, their cooperation, because a lot of these uh, systems that we're trying to build, we could not do uh, if it were not for the strong support that we're uh, receiving from them. But uh, any other closing thoughts that uh, you think either the President of the United States or the President of Vietnam or uh, any of these business leaders here uh, should hear about? Mr. President, um, uh, let me ask you a question. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> the tide has turned. So um, when you were a kid, yeah. uh, did you dream of becoming President one day? No. Uh, I think there's some people who, you know, they had a very clear vision for themselves. I, I really didn't, I, I was not as well organized as all of you uh, uh, when I was young. Um, I think it wasn't until I was uh, in college that I began to develop a sense of wanting to make a difference. And uh, even then, I did not know exactly how I might do it. I was actually very skeptical of politics uh, because I thought politicians uh, weren't always uh, looking out for the people, uh, that too often I thought they were looking out for themselves. So I actually worked in communities to try to hold politicians accountable. Uh, that was the first job that I, uh, I did in, in uh, nonprofit. Uh, the nonprofit sector. Uh, so it wasn't really until I, I think I finished law school that I thought that I might be interested uh, in public service. In fact, I went to law school with 
my, now, now as my trade representative, our ambassador, uh, uh, Michael Froman, and uh, he was much smarter than me. Um, but uh, it, it wasn't until uh, I came out of law school that I thought that maybe uh, I you know, might run for office at some point. But the important point I, I think uh, I want to make is that so many of the young people here today, certainly all of you, Kwa, um, well, you sort of qualify as young. I'm not, <laughs> you're young at heart. <laughs> These two are young. You're sort of. You're younger than me. Uh, but, uh, but so many of the young people I meet today, I think, uh, have a different idea of uh, their careers and their lives. I think they're much more sophisticated. I think the internet has exposed them to a lot more ideas of what they can do. Uh, I, I believe that uh, many young people recognize that the old system where you find yourself a job and then you work in that same job for 30 or 40 years uh, is less likely to be uh, the path for them because the economy is just changing so quickly. And so I think there's much more uh, interest on the part of all the young people I meet, uh, certainly here in Southeast Asia, uh, in the States, Africa, Europe, wherever I go, uh, to try to make it on their own uh, and to try to find collaborations with groups of people who are interested in the same things they are and to see if they can make it happen. Uh, and I, I, I think that's a, a wonderful thing. It's challenging. I think there's uh, uh, you know, one of the, the well-known rules in Silicon Valley is, is that uh, if you haven't failed quite a bit, then you're probably not a very good entrepreneur uh, because the first idea you have is not always going to work. And you have to be resilient and to be able to uh, learn from your failures as much as your successes. Uh, but uh, I, I truly believe that this generation is not only being entrepreneurial when it thinks about business, but also entrepreneurial when it thinks about trying to solve social problems, entrepreneurial when it thinks about uh, government and uh, making government more responsive and accountable to ordinary people. And uh, it makes me very hopeful for the future. So, okay. yeah. Um, I guess the entrepreneurial spirit is very much ingrained in Vietnamese people, just like the Americans. Um, and you have seen, and your staff have seen here, the very vibrant startup business community here in Ho Chi Minh City. Just imagine how much more it can be if there's more exchange of knowledge, of capital, technical know-how between the two countries, US and Vietnam. Uh, and on that note, uh, my question for you would be, if your daughter, taking a gap year from Harvard College, so you, tells you next week that she wants to live in Vietnam for a year. What did you tell her? Well, I, I would encourage it, but what I've learned is, is that uh, my daughter, Malia, will be uh, 18 next month, and she already doesn't listen to me, whatever I say. <laughs> so, the, uh, <laughs> so if you want her to come to Vietnam, I shouldn't be the one to tell her. Maybe uh, you should tell her. Yeah, absolutely. But, I, but certainly, uh, I, I would recommend students from the States to come and study here as much as I'm encouraging Vietnamese students to come study in the United States. I, uh, I, young people are going to be living in an interconnected world, in a global marketplace. And uh, every business has to think globally, even small businesses. You know, it, it, if you have a good product today, you can reach billions of people if you have a good strategy, you have good marketing, you can handle the logistics. Uh, and so the barriers to entry that used to exist where only a Boeing or a GE or a very large company could uh, operate in Vietnam uh, is no longer true. And the same is true for small businesses here in Vietnam. If you have a, 
interesting product that is unique and, and perhaps uh, is very common in Vietnam, but nobody knows about in, uh, in the United States. Uh, oftentimes, one, some of the best ways to start a business is to take something that is very popular one place, but is unknown someplace else, and uh, be, the, be the first person to sell that product uh, uh, in, in another country. So uh, I think part of the education that young people have to have is to understand other cultures and understand uh, you know, uh, other markets. If you're lucky enough to be able to travel, uh, then that's one way to do it. But you know, one of the wonderful things about the internet is it gives you an opportunity to learn about another place uh, even if you can't set foot there. So, uh, so that's something that I continually emphasize. So, all right, last, last uh, sure. question or comment. All right. I, I have a uh, question. You, uh, in your opening remarks, you uh, mentioned about TPP, and we didn't have a chance to talk about that. And so um, TPP is considered a 21st century trade agreement, um, dealing directly with the digital economy, uh, talking about you know, the uh, rules of law expanding to security and privacy, and also cross-border data flow. Uh, TPP is very important to Vietnam. And uh, I know that the Vietnamese business community supports it. And um, as an employee of Microsoft, uh, you know, I can reaffirm that our company supports TPP. Uh, as we look at the latest uh, report published by the US International Trade Commission uh, that indicates that uh, fully implemented TPP would bring about $57 billion into the U.S. economy. But currently, the U.S. Uh, American politics is sort of turning against TPP. So I'd like to hear from you is, what do you think is going to be, uh, what it takes to pass TPP in Washington, D.C., and what will you do in your uh, power to make that happen? Well, uh, it's a great question. And, and first of all, uh, just to, to describe why TPP is so important. Um, what, what TPP does is it takes 12 countries along the Asia Pacific region uh, that represent a huge portion of the entire world marketplace. And it says, we're going to create standards for trade and commerce that are fair, that create a level playing field. Uh, that have high standards, that encourage rule of law, that encourage protection of intellectual property. So if V or, or Hong come up with a great idea, somebody's not just going to steal it off the internet, but uh, the, the work that they put in is protected. Uh, that has strong environmental provisions so that uh, countries can't uh, just take advantage of no environmental protection to undercut uh, competitors who are following uh, more responsible environmental practices. Uh, and you know, not only do all the countries who are participating stand to gain from increased trade, uh, but Vietnam in particular, I think econo uh, economists who have studied it uh, believe uh, would be one of the biggest beneficiaries. Uh, from the United States perspective, it's a common sense thing to do because, frankly, our markets are already more open than many of the markets of the countries that are signing up. So uh, Japan, for example, is able to sell a lot of cars in the United States but has uh, a lot of problems importing beef from the United States. Uh, and what we've done is to make sure that a lot of the tariffs that are currently being placed on U.S. exports and U.S. goods are reduced. And so it'll create a better environment for U.S. businesses, particularly because of some of the intellectual property protections. A lot of what we sell today uh, are uh, are products of our knowledge-based economy. And so 
it's a smart thing to do across the board. Now, the problem in the United States uh, around trade, and this is not new, this has been true uh, for the last 30 years, uh, is that some of the previous trade agreements uh, did not have enforceable labor protections or environmental protections. I think when China came in uh, to the WTO, uh, it was able to take advantage of the growing global supply chain. And a lot of manufacturing shifted to China in a very visible way. So a lot of Americans saw companies close mm -hmm. and saw what they viewed as their jobs being exported to China. Uh, and some of that happened in, in Mexico with NAFTA as well. And so the perception was that this is bad for U.S. workers and U.S. jobs. If you look at the data, then what is true is that some manufacturing jobs were lost as a consequence of trade. On the other hand, other sectors of the economy improved significantly. And overall, it was good for the U.S. economy. But uh, I think that in the design of some of the old trade deals and some of the mistakes that may have been made in the past, um, you know, people became suspicious of, of trade and worried that if we do TPP, then the same pattern will repeat itself and U.S. will lose more jobs. Uh, my argument is that uh, if you're dissatisfied with the current trading arrangements where tariffs are placed on U.S. goods, but other people's goods are already coming into the U.S., why would you want to just maintain the status quo? Why not change it so that everybody's operating in a fair and transparent way? And uh, the good news is, is that the majority of Americans still believe in trade and still believe that it's good for our economy. Uh, the bad news is politics in the United States is not always, uh, how would I put it, reasonable. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, but I'm confident that we're going to be able to get it done because uh, in the past, uh, when we've negotiated trade deals, uh, even though there's a lot of opposition, at the end of the day, we end up getting it done. Uh, keep in mind that we negotiated a, a, a very big free trade agreement with Korea. Uh, and uh, even though the Bush administration negotiated it, he didn't get it passed. When I came into office, we were, one of the first things we did was we worked with Korea. Uh, we made some small modifications to some of the terms, and we got it done. And it's in force uh, today. Uh, so uh, you know, the argument that I've made, and I will continue to make in the United States, is that we're not going to uh, be able to end globalization. We have to make globalization work for us. And that means that uh, we don't try to put barriers and walls between us and the rest of the world. But instead, we try to make sure that the world has high standards, treats our companies fairly. And if we do that, uh, I'm confident we can compete with anybody. So. Uh, you know, nothing's easy in Washington these days. But, you know, despite uh, sometimes the lack of cooperation with Congress, I seem to be able to get a lot of things done anyway. Uh, it could have been easier. Uh, I, wouldn't, I would have less gray hair if, uh, if uh, Congress was working uh, more effectively. But we do have some members of Congress who are here. Uh, you know, I, that's uh, Congressman Castro and Congressman O'Rourke who are uh, two outstanding young uh, congressmen from Texas. They're strong TPP supporters, and uh, we're very proud of the work that they've done. So uh, you know, we're, we're just going to have to work hard to convince some of their colleagues. Uh, but ultimately, I think we can get it passed. So. Well, everybody, uh, I think that uh, if you had any uh, doubt about the outstanding future of, uh, of uh, Vietnamese uh, entrepreneurs, uh, then all those doubts have been pushed away because of the outstanding presentations by these three individuals. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much.